Welcome to the first episode of our podcast series for advisors considering the independent space. Today's episode is Independence, How Did We Get Here and Where Are We Going? I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, and on wealthmanagement.com, as well as iTunes and other resources. I have spent my life's work dedicated to helping advisors determine how and where to best serve their clients while enhancing their own business lives. And as such, We've watched and helped many advisors move from one traditional employee-based model to another. But what's changed most profoundly in the recent past is how, almost without exception, every conversation we have with any quality advisor always includes at least a limited discussion about what it means to go independent. Independence for sure is not for everyone, but everyone wants to know about it. They see it's where the puck is heading. They're watching many of their colleagues, respected colleagues that is, head in that direction. They're reading about multi-billion dollar moves to the independent space, and they're hearing stories every day about a new model being born. My goal in this podcast is to dispel some myths, to share some facts and updates, and to make everybody a little bit better educated. So this bi-weekly series was born of the notion of sharing our knowledge and insights on the topic with a wider audience from a platform that's easily accessed and completely confidential. Most importantly, my goal is to provide the tools and resources to help you decide if independence is right for you. In later episodes, we'll talk with those who have made the leap, as well as with industry thought leaders who can add their unique perspective to our dialogue. Let's start from the beginning, quickly. How did we get here? What were the forces at play? For one, the financial crisis of 2008 had a big impact because advisors began to lose confidence in large numbers in senior leadership at the big firms. The age of the big banks. So as the financial crisis took hold and big banks came in, more big banks came in and bought brokerage firms, we began to see a culture clash, an incongruence, if you will, between a bank mentality, which is largely risk averse, and a wealth management mentality, which is much more entrepreneurial. Advisors began to mourn the loss, if you will, of beloved culture, familiarity, and an entrepreneurial spirit, things that they remembered of their firms from days gone by we began to see some really interesting and relevant new models being born. Focus Financial Partners, a boutique private equity firm, today the leading investor in the independent space, was born in 2006. And we'll discuss more about this model and others in a later episode. But it was a trendsetter for sure. The independent broker-dealer model, like LPL, like Wells Fargo Finet and the like, began to see real accelerated growth in 2009 as people began to demonstrate and vote with their feet that they valued independence, freedom, flexibility, and control more than working for a big brand name firm, meaning they began to say we trust ourselves and our business more than we trust senior leaders at the major firms. Maverick and industry disruptor Hightower Advisors was born in late 2008 and began to really validate the space by recruiting some of the best corner office advisors. It started with $1.3 billion ex-Morgan Stanley advisor and team Nick Bappas in Salt Lake City, followed by Rich Saperstein's mega team from J.P. Morgan Securities or Legacy Bear Stearns in New York, former New York City UBS team, Chris Davis and Matthias Kulmi, all in 09, and then five more really impressive teams in 2010. Following that, leaders like Elliot Weissbluth, founder of Hightower, and others, both from the wirehouse world and other really smart entrepreneurs, were and still are deep in the lab, building new and exciting models. 
These folks, were the, the early adapters anyway, were considered a trifecta of prescient, super smart, and for sure lucky. Over time and continuing today, more and more entrepreneurials from the traditional space, private equity firms, investors, banks, all want and begin to flock and want a foothold in the independent space, making this whole breakaway culture, the notion of the breakaway advisor, the wirehouse or employee-based advisor moving toward independence, a real thing, not just a passing phase. As such, a whole cottage industry was born to support these breakaway advisors, lawyers, transition consultants, banks to lend money, growth consultants, tech firms, and service providers. It seems also that almost every day a new version of independence is born so that advisors are able to define and very likely to find their version of utopia and just how independent they want to be. So corner office advisors in dribs and drabs at first, and then more and more began to vote with their feet and go some version of independent. It seemed as though overnight independence went from being what was a passing phase or fad to a viable and super legitimate alternative to life inside a traditional brokerage firm. And all of a sudden, being viewed as a real threat to the wirehouse world. For a long time, leaders in, at traditional firms in the wirehouse world dismissed the independent space, never saw it as a threat, or at least never acknowledged it as such. And when a quality advisor or any advisor crossed the transom and left the big firm to break away and go independent, wirehouse leaders dismissed it as we wanted to lose that guy. It was planned attrition. He wasn't a great advisor anyway. Today, it's much harder to dismiss. So much so, and here's one of the biggest game changers, is that the big firms like Morgan, like Merrill, like Goldman Sachs, like UBS, are making their products, their capital markets capabilities, for example, available to independent firms, figuring if we can't beat them, join them, so that they protect their distribution channel, making it so that the playing field's been leveled, that an advisor, whether he is he or she is with Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or the like, or the most independent entity he could be, he still will have access to any and all platform capabilities he may need. So for the past decade, we've seen this model grow from what many consider to be a fad to a legitimate option for top industry talent. It certainly raises the question, is this the future of the industry? Meaning is the breakaway movement the future of the industry? And how big a trend is it really? It starts with the fact that on Wall Street reports that average AUM or assets under management per advisor going independent has grown steadily since 2014 to an average of more than $500 million per advisor in 2017. I recall in 2014, uh, a $7 billion wirehouse team joined Raymond James Independent Model, and everybody thought that was an anomaly and just unbelievable, a one-off. But since that time, we've watched in excess of 80 advisors, so that's 80 high-quality advisors in a period of three or four years, break away and go independent. Certainly as a percentage, given the behemoth size of each of the big firms, losing a combined total of 80 advisors probably isn't that big a deal. But it's a big deal because it's the quality of the advisors making the move that's most noteworthy. But the trend seems to be accelerating, and that's the most exciting thing as well. In fact, between January of 2016 and July of 2017, by my count, so it may not be exact, we've seen $26 billion plus teams break away, the largest of which was this year in 2017, when a Goldman Sachs advisor managing $12 billion in assets left to go independent, leveraging dynasty financial partners. That's especially notable, not just because of the size of the deal, 
but also because Goldman Sachs, being a non-protocol firm and the most litigious firm, that departure was probably one of the most difficult. And it makes people say, if a Goldman Sachs advisor can make it happen, so can everyone else. So the reality is that independence in its many flavors is here to stay. Of that, we're sure. That said, it's not for everyone. So let's take a few minutes to drill down on the profile of the typical independent advisor. And we'll run through them quickly. One, for sure they have entrepreneurial DNA. There are people that say things like, I started a lawn mowing business when I was 15, a business out of my college dorm, etc. And there are people for sure that value freedom, flexibility, and control more than anything. They're open-minded and flexible because while an independent advisor doesn't have to sacrifice anything in terms of quality or quantity when it comes to platform and service, how he or she access what he needs is different and it requires a modicum of flexibility. They're typically not a lone wolf. They're people that have a team even a next generation to support them. They're hyper-focused on clients and how best to serve them. So always looking for ways to better the client service model. They're definitely more long-term focused than short-term. Doesn't mean they don't take into account the short-term economics or what they'd leave behind, but their real focus, what they're really jazzed about is building an enterprise and building long-term enterprise value and equity. They're willing to leave some chips on the table. Again, doesn't mean they're going to walk away from what is a safe retirement or all unvested deferred comp, but it means that they care less about getting the biggest deal in the short term, and again, much more about building something for the long term. They're confident and realistic about client portability and their pipeline and growth prospects because they believe in the depth of their relationships and the nature of their business. They're again excited about building an enterprise. It's worth noting that age has nothing to do with it. I've met 40-somethings who lack the stamina or desire to go independent, and nothing wrong with that at all. And we moved a 72-year-old last year in partnership and conjunction with his next generation team to independence. In fact, I wrote an article about this very topic. If you visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on podcast, and the episode one page for a link to this article, you'll find it and others like it helpful. So as we wind down this episode, what you should know is this. While there will always be top advisors working for traditional brokerage firms, and there should be, the diaspora to independence is more than just a flavor of the day. And we'll talk much more of that in future episodes. For now, I thank you for listening. I also want to thank wealthmanagement.com for sharing this podcast with their readers and subscribers. I hope you'll join me for our next episode as I help you to determine if you've got the right stuff to go independent. Certainly an important step before you get too deep in the process of exploring your options. Until then again, I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants with an S at the end, dot com, and click on the tools and resources link for some valuable content. And if you're not already a recipient of our weekly email, what we call Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. Feel free for sure to email or call me if you have any specific questions. I can always be reached at my office number, 908-879-1002, or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants with an S at the end, dot com. Please certainly know that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And we close, this is Mindy Diamond on Independence.